I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Welcome back to another episode of Joshua Answers His Emails. I, I have always made a practice of just making videos about whatever I'm doing, and more and more these days, I spend time answering questions in emails instead of, like, flying my own quads. And the problem is that that doesn't result in you guys getting useful content. And then one day I went, hey, let's bring them along for the ride. So what we're going to look at here is an email. A, uh, a video, a video sent from a fella. He needs, he said, needs some help. The quad is stuttering and twitching. He hasn't changed any settings or anything. Let's figure out what's wrong with the quad. So this kind of twitching and stuttering to me, I think it is usually caused by a failing gyro. Um, it has a very characteristic look. Like sometimes the quad seems to be flying okay and then just suddenly it starts t t twitching and kind of having a seizure. I don't know what the right way to put it is. It's still flyable. You can still keep it in the air except when it's twitching. So as I say in the answer, there are a couple of other things that can cause this. You definitely are going to want to make sure uh, that nothing is touching, hitting, or tapping the flight controller. Honestly, that this is so severe that I really doubt that, but you're going to want to check it and you're going to want to look for anything that could cause the flight controller to vibrate badly. If you have a loose or broken standoff and the flight controller is kind of slapping and flapping as the quadcopter moves, that could actually cause this. So give the quadcopter a good physical once over, make sure nothing is broken or loose, and then you may have to replace the flight controller. Hmm. And the question that will then come up is, what could cause the gyro to fail? I don't, you know, you crash the quadcopter enough times or you just get unlucky with the with the hardware lottery and the flight controller fail. It just happens. There is one other thing. One other thing that you might try. I have seen some cases where if you're using BL Heli 32 ESCs, if you change the BL Heli 32 motor PWM frequency, it stops kind of freakouts like this. I don't think that's very likely, but before you replace your flight controller, it might be worth a try. That's the answer. Thanks for uh, sending your question, and thank you guys for coming along uh, in the answer. This next email comes from Giorgio, who says, thanks for your content on YouTube. I'd like to ask you some advice on how to deal with Banggood. I've had a lot of problems with orders and shipping on their website. I've had two orders canceled after waiting for a month. They sell stuff and then it goes into back order before they ship it and then they want to cancel the order. Is this normal for them or just bad service? Hmm. In Europe, we have some nice shops, but the prices are obviously not com comparable. What do you suggest I do? Well, that is just, that's just how it is if you shop at Banggood. Um, sometimes you get okay customer service, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get a great product at a great price, sometimes you get a dead product and they don't even give you a full refund. These are just, you just, that's the risk of shopping there. Many people shop at Banggood and are happy with the, with the outcome. And as you say, the prices are, are, are really much higher in European shops. So you, you buy from Banggood, it takes three weeks for it to get there. You, you saved a lot of money. Hopefully you get a good product. Sometimes you don't. And the times when you don't get a good product, you just kind of got to eat it and consider that the cost of doing business. Um, hopefully you come out ahead in the long run. If if you've had a bad experience or two bad experiences in a row and you're just like, screw bang good, I'm done, I'm out of here. Hey, no, yeah, no hard feelings. But support your local shops. I know a lot of people, a lot of people live in an area where they don't have a good local shop that they can buy from. Um, shipping or import fees are just too high. And, and, and a lot of people in certain countries Banggood is really just the only option for them, but vendors like that. If you're lucky enough to live somewhere with great vendors, definitely support your local vendors um, if you can afford to, if you feel like you can afford to. That's the answer. Next question from Sven. Sven writes, I flew one of my five inch quads in Mexico last year. I got some footage on the coast. Two months later, the quad just barreled out of the sky. Uh, I wonder if flying it so close to the ocean that the salt had chewed into something. If you fly in a salty environment, maybe you should take the drone and like what, rinse it down with fresh water and let it dry. Hmm. That might not be a bad idea. Uh, salt water is very, very corrosive. Even salt spray can be very corrosive if allowed to dry onto um, any metal, certainly electronics. Uh, it, it really just depends how close you flew to the ocean, I guess. Uh, I definitely agree that the kind of damage you get from corrosion would 
like kind of build up over time, it's totally plausible to me that you flew in a salty environment and like two months later, that was when it finally fell out of the sky. That being said, quadcopters fall out of the sky all the time. I mean, if you still got the quad, you, you should be able to look. And if salt water got on it, it, it you're going to see the corrosion. It's going to be pretty freaking obvious. Um, if you do, anybody out there, if you do get salt water on your quad, you, what you need to do is number one, power it down. If it was powered up, unplug the battery as soon as possible. And then number two, just douse it in fresh water as much as possible. Rinse the salt off of there. Fresh water is actually, and if even better is distilled water if you can get it. But uh, I was once uh, with Rotorite in Orlando and we were getting off of a boat on a beach and one of my quads fell off my backpack and fell in the surf. I picked it up, immediately opened a fresh a water bottle that we had and just dunked it all in the, and it was fine. It was fine a week later. Maybe it's dead now. I don't know. But that's the fix is you, you want to just, and it, it may not save it. It, once it's in salt water, it may just be dead, but that is the fix. Um, if you regularly fly near salt near salt water, you're going to want to conformal coat the crap out of your quad. What does conformal help against salt water? Good question. Hmm. I also know the stuff they use. There's a st stuff called uh, shake and bake drone dry. Uh, Do they stop making it? Somebody told me that they stopped making it. I don't know if that's true. I don't think I know. I think they still make it. This stuff, this stuff is actually not an, not a waterproofing agent. It is actually an anti corrosion agent. See, the thing is that the damage from water is mostly actually caused from corrosion, not from the water. So the idea is that you can actually. So this actually might be a really good thing to look at if you fly in salt water because it's specifically anti corrosion. Although it is worth pointing out that this stuff actually. Conformal coating sticks really well to the quad. It's it's relatively hard to scrape it off. It's relatively robust, whereas this stuff rubs off really easily. So you might you might need to reapply it, and it's not exactly cheap. Anyway, those are some options. Thanks, Sven, for your question. This next question comes from Mark, who writes, My grandson is an accomplished RC fixed-wing pilot and has become obsessed with drones. He has a jumper T8SG transmitter and wants to know if he can run a TBS receiver and crossfire in it if it would be better off to get a Tyrannus X90 SE and do you need to get a TBS module or do you need just buy the receiver? Um, the Jumper T8SG runs the deviation firmware and I know for a fact that the OpenTX firmware such as used in the Jumper uh, T12, is it the T12? And the X9 DSE, I know that Crossfire works with those. My, my initial thought was no, Crossfire doesn't work with Jumper T8SG. However, the Jumper T8SG does have a JR module bay. The module will plug in, and I did a little Google search, and I'll be gosh darned, at least one guy out there, two guys out there, says it can be done. Oh, psh, if Albert Kim says it can be done, well, I guess it can be done. But I would do some research before you really... There may be some kinks, uh, you know, if, if, if Albert Kim is saying, hey, it, it appears to be working, uh, that suggests that maybe maybe there are some kinks and some hitches. So it might work, but I think you should verify that before you dive in. Are you better off getting an X9DSE? Since this is your grandson, actually, I think the T8SG is a pretty good transmitter for people with smaller hands. The X9DSE, I've seen some kids try to fly with it, and it's really big in their freaking hands. Um, so I personally think the ergonomics on the X9 DSE are a little better and it definitely does work with Crossfire, but you may do better with the T8SG for a kid and you already own it. So mm. do you have to get a TBS module or do you just need to buy a receiver? No, you have to buy the module and the receiver. Your Tyrannus or, or your T8SG cannot bind. It, it, it does have a multi-protocol module, but that does not include support for Crossfire. So you do need to get the TBS module. I would recommend getting the TBS micro module, the, the small one, not the big one, the, plug, the little one that plugs into the JR bay. That is more than enough range for, for anything that he's going to be doing. I... I got, you didn't ask this part, but I got to ask, why are you going with Crossfire? I mean, especially for a beginner, the 2.4 gig is is going to give you plenty of range for and and Crossfire is wonderful, but it's it's a little expensive and got some little you know hoops you got to jump through. So, I mean, if you 
If you want to, go for it. But for a beginner, I would just say start with 2.4 gigahertz, fly with what you got and spend that money on something else. The next question is from Scott, who has built a five inch quad with the T-Motor F55A Pro ESC and the amps at Betaflight show us 86 amps. Well, clearly that's not correct. Um, getting current sensing working correctly is a little bit of a challenge for a lot of people. But the F55 Pro ESC makes it particularly challenging because it does something really unexpected. The F55A uh, ESC supports ESC telemetry. And so you would think that that's how you're going to get the current sense data into your flight controller, but not so. Some ESCs these days are taking current sensing out of the ESC telemetry and they're using analog current sense instead. Why? I'm not actually sure, but my best guess is that when you do um, when you do ESC telemetry current sensing, you need four separate current sensors. You need four separate shunt resistors. And I think they would rather just have one shunt resistor, but that but it doesn't work that way with current with the ESC telemetry. So if you look at the pinout of the Pro 55, yeah, what you're gonna see is that there is both a TX, that's ESC telemetry, and current, that's analog current sense pad. And this is confusing because in the past, some ESCs have had both of these and it was up to you. You could do ESC telemetry and get the current that way, or you could do analog and get it that way. That's not how this ESC works. This really bit me one day. I spent a long time tr troubleshooting, verifying, yes, ESC telemetry is definitely working. So where is the current sense data? The current sense data is here in the analog current sense pad and not here. And you can you can verify that for yourself by the fact that we have one big shunt resistor here. That means analog current sensing as opposed to four smaller shunt resistors, which would be ESC telemetry. So what you need to do is go into Betaflight and you need to make sure that your current sensor in the power and battery tab, you need to make sure that it is set to internal ADC. And you're gonna need to connect the current wire to the current sense input on your flight controller, assuming it has one, which not all of them do, and in which case you might be boned. That's the answer to your question, Scott. This question comes from Gramps, who flies whoop style quads with linear antennas. His goggles have the true D module. He flies more to the side and back would be a good antenna combination for the goggles. Uh, in this case, I, I still recommend using circular polarized antennas on the goggles, even though your quad has a linear antenna. And the reason for that is that if you have two linear antennas and they get out of orientation with each other, just as the quad flies around, you could get significant polarization loss. Whereas if you have one li uh, linear antenna and one circular antenna, then you can't get and there's no, the orientation of the antennas doesn't matter. Um, what I would really recommend is an Omni and a patch antenna and turn your seat so that you're facing in the direction you're flying so the patch can pick up the quad the best. If you absolutely can't do that and you have to fly behind yourself a lot, then the patch is gonna be wasted much of the time because you're just not pointed at the quad, in which case you might go with two Omni antennas uh, attach them to the true D and put them at like a 45 degree, 90 degree orientation to each other. Pam asks about her son flying an Eosheen Wizard X220. He wants to go from 3S to 4S and asks what battery I would suggest. Um, if you're in the United States, the Race Day Quads line uh, is good uh, on a budget, decent performance. Some of them have great performance. The GetFPV Xylo line of batteries is also good on a budget. Uh, internationally, I like CNHL. Everybody likes CNHL, let's be honest. Um, if you can find CNHL on sale, you can actually get a heck of a, a heck. You can get a $25 battery for like $18 if you buy them on sale. I have had it happen that when you buy a battery on a CNHL sale, it takes like a month for them to ship it to you, but you do get it eventually. Uh, the other one that I'm looking at right now is the Ovonic line. Um, these are also available like from, I don't know, Amazon, Banggood. They're international. And I'm hearing rumors that they are just rebadged sort of B-grade batteries from a major name brand manufacturer. I won't repeat those rumors since I don't know if they're true. But I will say that there are a couple guys here in Knoxville who swear by the Ovonic batteries. So that's good enough for me. This question comes from someone whose name I will leave out because I might be a little embarrassed about what happened. 
Um, he plugged in his Tiny Hawk uh, with the wrong battery, and the little 1S plug started to smoke. <laughs> of course, he unplugged the battery as soon as he saw smoke. After a few hours, he tried to fly with the right battery, and only two of the motors will spin. And the battery is a little bit melted. So what should he do? I'm sorry to say that it's impossible to know exactly what you did. Did you plug the other battery in backwards or, or did you accidentally plug in a, I don't know what happened, but the bottom line is sure. Go ahead and replace the plug. Maybe it's okay, but I think based on the fact that only two of the motors spin, probably you also fried the flight controller, but I mean, Hey, it'll take you a few minutes to replace the battery plug. Maybe it's okay. And lesson learned? Here's a question from Roberto, who is using a Radiolink R6DS S-Bus receiver with my flight controller. This is a really not a very common receiver for me to see, but it does output S-Bus and it will work. And he just wants me to check his wiring diagram. Okay, so what do we got here? This is the S-Bus output. Good. And yeah, okay, I'm just going to assume that the order of the wires is correct. The 5-volt wire is always the middle wire. The signal wire and the ground wire are always on the outside. In case you didn't know, that's so that uh, if you plug the servo plug in backwards, you don't fry anything because the middle wire is always in the middle, even if you plug it in backwards. We're going to 5 volts, signal, and ground. Yep, that's fine. We got the ESCs here. Yep, that's all fine. What do we got over here? The camera. This is going to, so I would not put the camera on bat plus here. There's two reasons I wouldn't do that. One of them is that you're going to have your main battery wire there. So soldering another wire on top of it will be a little annoying. The other reason is that if you solder to this pad, the current pulled by the device will not be counted because it will not go through the current sensor. So it'll throw off your, for the camera, it's such a small amount of current. It doesn't matter, but if you need bat v bat for some purpose it's better to use the esc plus pad not the main battery pad but in this case this is the v bat plus wire on this camera and in fact you don't even need that just get rid of that that is only used if you are using the internal osd on the camera and you're not you're using the osd on the jb flight controller so just get rid of that wire you don't even need it now let's see the other thing is you can run the camera off of nine volts. And in fact, that's how the flight controller is designed. But some people get better results by running it off the VBAT using the ESC plus pad. So if you have any problems, like if your motors are particularly powerful and, and when you, when you uh, punch the throttle or when you do a sharp flipper roll at the camera browns out or something, uh, that could be fixed by moving from nine volt to ESC plus. The other thing we need to check is that the input voltage for this VTX is okay. And you see it's rated seven to 24 volts. So it's okay at nine volts. Same thing. If you, if you feel like you want to try, if you have video noise or if in any other way, you're unsatisfied with your performance of your video system. One of the things to try is to move the, the power from nine volts to ESC plus. I know that's counterintuitive because nine volts is filtered. So shouldn't nine volts always be cleaner than ESC plus? Well, Sometimes it's not. Everything else looks good. Yeah, everything else looks good. Oh, and you got the solder bridge too, good for you. Don't forget uh, if you're using a JB ESC or if you're using any four in one ESC, oh, but you're not, okay, never mind. You would have to solder bridge this guy as well, but you're using individual ESCs, so you are good. This next one is a question from Jake who rebuilt his quad and switched to, hey, my flight controller um, and is having some problems, damn. One of the problems he's having is that he loses video feed if he goes full stick deflection. Hmm. I guess the first thing that I, hmm, I didn't think of this. I already wrote it, the answer to him. Does he mean he lose video feed? He says even OSD, but that makes me wonder if he's going to black screen. If you're going to black screen, it means your camera's dropping out. If you're going to static, it means your VTX is dropping out. That's the rule of thumb. And what I suggest there is that you just move the power for the VTX or the camera from the nine volt regulator over to ESC plus. And it's just a troubleshooting thing. Um, if you do that and the problem goes away, it means the regulator was browning out. Um, so that just tells you where the problem was and you can work from there. 
Uh, Jake also has hot motors on Betaflight 404. Damn. Uh, Betaflight 402 was supposed to fix the hot motor problem and flyaway problem that Betaflight 400 was having. I just don't even know what to say. Um, I'm going to guess that the motors were not blazing hot before you switched to my flight, my, the new flight controller with Betaflight 404. So if you know how to tweak the filters, you can start lowering the filter cutoff value. But the filtering in 404 is not very, it's fairly conservative. So I wouldn't expect you to get super hot motors. I guess what I'm going to suggest is that you use this link to go back to Betaflight 357 filtering and like, I don't know, see if that fixes it. I, um, yeah. Here's a question from Aldo, who is wiring up a FreeSky X4R to a Lumineer Lux F7. And it's the FreeSky X4R SB. That's a good thing because it outputs S bus. Um, since you've got this side plug, that's probably what you're gonna wanna use to power the, um, the receiver. You can get five volts and ground on the red and black wire. This white wire here is analog in. You don't need to be using that. And this yellow wire is for smart port telemetry, which also is completely optional, although it does enable some nice features. The other thing you're going to need is the S bus pin. That is the pin on the bottom side. This pin right here, bottom left, the pin closest to this plug right here. That is the S-Bus signal, and that pin is going to go to the UART RX pad on the Luminaire Lux F7. So here's the Luminaire Lux F7, and if we look here, where have they intended for you to put the... Oh, here's a wiring diagram. Isn't that convenient? Where do they intend for you to put the receiver? S-Bus to R2, smart port to T2? That doesn't... Wow, oh, yeah, well, they want you to do soft serial. That's... Well, that's beyond the scope of this question, but you're going to put the S bus wire to pin R2 on the flight controller. The red wire is going to go to the 4V5 pad. That's this one right here. Here we go. 4V5. Oh, there's got to be more than one of those because they're using this one for the GPS. Where's the other one? There it is. Ah, there we go. So here we go. T2, R2, 4V5, ground. So you're going to put S bus to R2. Red wire to 4V5, black wire to ground. That is how you're going to wire that up. And the thing you got to really worry about, well, don't worry. don't You don't have to worry, but the thing you have to be the most careful about is that you get the 5 volt and ground correct. If you put the signal wire on the wrong UART, nothing's going to fry. But if you put 5 volts where it's not supposed to go, something could fry. This pin right here, that's the S-Bus output. Mr. Raff asks my quad does a death roll whenever i flip back and only back i don't know what to do um if the quadcopter death rolls after a flip or roll and it goes in the direction of the flip or roll then it's one of the motors on that side usually that's the problem so if you do a backflip and at the end of the backflip the quad does a death roll to the back it's one of the back motors. Uh, I would swap the motor. If you look at the DVR, you may be able to see very carefully that it the back left goes down, and that's the direction it rolls. So that would indicate the back left motor was the problem. Um, so swap the motor, and if that doesn't work, swap the ESC. And if that doesn't work, throw the whole quadcopter in the trash. No, <laughs> that's that's what I would do, though. This question comes from Philip who has a King Kong ET Max Drone Racer Grayson Hobby Edition with a jumper transmitter and a FreeSky RXSR receiver, and he's having trouble getting Betaflight to see the receiver. The receiver channels aren't moving. And the first thing I always do in a situation like this is I ask for a photo of the wiring. You can always try and talk somebody through the wiring. The green wire goes here, the red wire goes there, but just ask for a photo is so much more helpful because a lot of times you'll notice details that they have would have overlooked, for example. And what we see here is that he's actually got a pre-made jumper cable so there's no soldering and there's no chance for a mistake but let's just make sure when I first looked at this I thought aha the wiring is wrong because I saw this yellow wire and usually it's the green wire on an RXSR that is the S-Bus out but no 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 it is in the correct position pin 2 is the S-Bus out yep everything is right here and unfortunately that makes my job a lot more difficult because 
I don't know what freaking flight controller this is. Bought it from Grayson Hobby. Grayson Hobby is known for their excellent customer. No, I don't want to submit. Go away. Grayson Hobby is known for their excellent customer support. And, and that's how why they get away from marking up freaking... Oh, 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 are they going to tell us? I guarantee you if you call these guys up, they'll have you your receiver working in a jiffy. And they'll know off the top of their head because they set it up. Oh, 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 am I going to find it? King Kong... ET series. Aha. Oh, I'm going to find it. RX3. Bingo. It's RX3. Okay. So that's the answer. The next thing we got to do is we got to check your ports tab, my friend. You are at three. Now I'm going to, damn it. I'm going to forget. Okay. Now I'll, now I don't have to forget what you are. It's on. <laughs> and there we go, folks. Uh, that is it. That is my evening. <laughs> Pass through my emails. Um, could still uh, open up Facebook and do some more messages there, but I think I won't, or or Discord. Thank you guys so much for following along with me. Um, and this little glimpse into what my uh, what my days are like. Happy flying. Uh -huh.